requirement that you have some kind of dinosaur exhibit. Um, and so that has certainly been something that we've done here at the Buffalo Museum of Science when we opened our doors in 1929. We had dinosaurs actually in this main hall, in what we call Hamlin Hall, we had some dinosaurs in the center. And they've moved around the building over the last um, eight or so years. Most recently, we had dinosaurs company in the back. And then we rethought how our natural store collection was interpreted to the public when we opened our new science studio, We Think Extinct. And here, we really wanted to think about not just dinosaurs, but where dinosaurs fit in that continuum of time. One of the things that I struggle with daily is the idea of geological time. When you're talking about millions and millions of years, like our brains just can't compute. You know, we think in days and weeks, and um, it's very, very hard to think in millions of years. Um, and also, um, one of the things that we were able to do as part of the extinct was bring back one of our favorite dinosaurs here, Allosaurus. It's actually Allosaurus is the only di articulated dinosaur skeleton in the collection that actually has real fossils. Most of the other full dinosaurs that we have from, in the collection are actually casts, but not Allosaurus. Allosaurus came to Buffalo in the 1960s um, from an excavation actually in Utah. And when he arrived, he was just in these crates uh, with fossils and straw, and the comparators in the geological section here at the museum had to basically piece Allosaurus back together like a big jigsaw puzzle without the box. There were about two-thirds of Allosaurus' skeleton was included. The rest of the material was cast from collections all over in order to give the visitors here a complete skeleton. When it was also first done, he used to kind of sit upright. Really kind of strange position for a dinosaur. I don't know what they were thinking in the 1960s, but that's how they did it. And what we did, when we, we did this gallery, was to use current science and current interpretations to, we took an Allosaurus apart and we rearticulated or put him back together the way scientists believe we roamed the Earth 150 million years ago. He looks like a meat-eating dinosaur, we know that from the teeth, um, but he looks kind of like a T-Rex, but they actually lived 85 million years apart. Again, that idea of, of geological time, I just can't get my mind around it. So, um, Allosaurus greets you and introduces you to Rethink Estate, but let's see some more of the collection items in this great gallery. So we start with a graphic to try and understand what all what our geological time looks like. And it's it's really impossible when you look at how much human intervention has been in the history of Earth. But we how do we know about that? How do we know about what came before? Well, we look at fossils, we look at the environment. And so the way that this gallery is laid out is a sort of a timeline of um, the items in our collection. And so we start with the Paleozoic. We're looking at 542 million years ago. Again, some of these specimens from right here in Buffalo. Um, the Eurypterids were found here in Buffalo uh, from a quarry in Main Street. So that's what was um, inhabiting Western New York all those millions and millions of years ago. Of course, the uh, Eurypterid is the state fossil of New York. We have some, so we laid out this gallery using the mass extinctions or these moments in time where there was a large change in the flora and fauna. Of course, the most popular of these time periods, of course, because of the dinosaurs, is maybe the Mesozoic or the age of dinosaurs. They're very popular, Triceratops here being no exception. Um, unlike Allosaurus, though, our Triceratops skeleton is entirely a cast, which means it was made from, um, it was cast from a real specimen, actually from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And again, this is an older interpretation of what Triceratops would have looked like. Current, current, currently, scientists believe that he, you know, the, the position of his shoulder blades, the position of his legs is not actually scientifically accurate. So one of the fascinating things about science, about collections, is always reevaluating 
what um, one person's interpretation is and being able to accept that, that it changes over time. We did make the decision, however, not to take apart this particular specimen and re-articulate it because that could change again. And so this is one um, interpretation of what Triceratops could have looked like. Another um, popular piece from our collection here is this um, skull dome of Pachycephalosaurus, the dinosaur that's given the, the um, he always looks like he's going to headbutt his parts, and that is a real uh, fossil as opposed to a cast. Our Ankylosaurus tail club is a cast. So just from an interesting sort of fact here at the museum, so we are able to cast, a lot of times are left outside of their cases, and then the real specimens or the real fossils are in the vitrines just to protect them and keep them in a more appropriate microclimate. We even have here a seropod fossil. This has real material in it, and you can touch this one. So if you ever really want, what other opportunity do you get to actually touch a real dinosaur? right here in Buffalo. So continuing on, we go past um, the age of the dinosaurs and we're into the Cenozoic or the age of mammals. We've chosen um, to show a collection here um, that's actually quite important to the Buffalo Museum of Science, and that is a collection of material from um, mastodons that were right here in Western New York. Most of this material was generated from a field exposition in Genesee County in Byron, New York. Um, and here we have a variety of different uh, mastodon specimens. So the mastodon is believed to have gone extinct about 10,000 years ago. We also bring our timeline of uh, life on Earth, or our timeline of extinction, up to more contemporary things. Here we have a dodo. Our dodo is a model of what a dodo is believed to have looked like. They are real feathers, but it is a, a model. In fact, there is no existing taxidermy mount of a dodo. And when you think that the dodo went extinct relatively um, recently in geological time, of course, it's quite surprising that there is not a taxidermy specimen. Um, at the Science Museum in London, they do have um, some skeletal material or an articulated skeleton, um, but the dodo is exceedingly rare. And then we bring it all the way up to contemporary endangered species here with our uh, lowland gorilla, who just has the greatest, most enchanting eyes that seem to follow you as you walk through the entire gallery. So the idea being with this particular interpretation is that Yes, you have to have a dinosaur hall in order to be a natural history museum, but what do dinosaurs mean to us today? What can they tell us? What can we learn from fossils and from dinosaurs to tell us and inform us about contemporary society? And how do we sort of make that connection to millions of years ago? Um, so exhibits like this at the Buffalo Museum of Science are put together in a group, it's not one person, it is a team effort. We have curators, we have scientists, we have exhibit people, and then we have our team of educators who really drill deep down into the um, content behind the collections that we present to you. Hi, I'm Sarah Jane with the Buffalo Museum of Science. I'm the director of museum programs and experiences. Um, I also really like rocks, so that's why I'm here. Um, so just talk a little bit about fossils in general. Um, so fossils, they are leftovers from things that lived a long time ago. Um, it really could be anything. It could be footprints, it could be, you know, their droppings, it, or it could be their bones. Um, so we'll talk about that. But um, one of the biggest questions that I get at the museum is, what dinosaurs can we find in Western New York? I'm sorry, we can't. <laughs> um, and actually, in New York State, only one dinosaur has been found through the entire time, um, through the entire state. It's called Coelophysis. Our rocks are actually too old. So um, our rocks are about, they're about like 380-ish million years old, whereas the dinosaurs, they didn't come over until over 100 million years after that. 
So, just want to get that out of the way, but I want to talk a little bit about fossilization in general. So, um, throughout history, throughout the history, there's times where rocks are being laid down, and there's rock times where rocks are being eroded or taken away. So during the time where the rocks are being laid down, that's when you get fossils, kind of like this. So um, I want to show you, this actually, um, the last steps here, it shows a really good story. Not, a lot of times we don't get a story, we get parts of the story, but this one's pretty good. So you can see here the, um, I guess they're the last steps of, of this animal here. So you can see they're kind of walking along, they'd be the, the bed of, um, like under the ocean. So on the floor of the ocean, it looks pretty, you know, pretty smooth sailing. Then eventually you'll notice that the footprints get a little more, I guess, I don't know, it's they're a little more bendy than normal. And then, yeah. So something's happening to this animal where it's not, they're not able to, I guess, keep their coordination up. And then, poor little buddy, let, no, had its final resting place right there. Um, kind of, so, so ideas about this, a lot of times this happens, I guess the, the change in the footprint indicates that maybe it was swept out somewhere where it didn't have enough oxygen in the water. So um, without the oxygen, it had a hard time, I guess, yeah, breathing, and then it passed away. Um, one cool thing about this though, so this is a horseshoe crab, and, so, and this, this horseshoe crab is from the, what's called the late Jurassic, so about um, 155 million years ago, roughly. But take a look, oh, there we go. Take a look at, it's, I guess it's modern cousin. It looks pretty similar. So horseshoe crabs are what's called a, a living fossil, so really they haven't changed much, um, at least to their, their, their outside morphology, what they look like, they haven't changed in a really, really But um, a lot of times fossils, the fossils in our area, especially in fossils around the world, you tend to get more if there's water. So um, is what ends up happening, for example, this, and it may, what, need, what needs to happen in order for something to be fossilized is that it needs to get buried quick. Um, so it dies, boom, it gets buried. Otherwise it starts to rot, gets gross, but if you get buried really quick, that's when you get really good, um, good conditions to make a fossil. Sorry, little buddy, poor little buddy. So this happened under the ocean, likely was buried, and we were able to reconstruct a little story from 155 billion years ago. Um, but yeah, let's go take a trip. Let's go take a look at some other kind of fossils. So over on this side, we have some examples of the kinds of things that can be fossilized, or more typically fossilized. So these are all parts of a, a Tyrannosaurus rex. So right there we have, it's a femur. And as we all know about T-Rex, they have really, really, you know, strong legs, but real tiny little legs, or little, little tiny arms. So um, the kinds of things that tend to fossilize better, they're usually harder. Because um, what happens during the fossilization process is that the hard parts, so for example, bone, get replaced by rock. So a lot of um, so things that are I guess squishy. I mean, for example, a jellyfish wouldn't doesn't fossilize very well. So here, I mean, these are all casts of the different things um, in a T-Rex. So not just bones. We also have some teeth. So all of those kind of hard parts. That being said, for a really long time in the world's history, there were organisms that didn't have hard parts. And so there's a lot of, there's only so much that we could learn from, um, from the fossils that we find. So um, like a lot of, uh, for example, microbes and stuff like that, they didn't preserve very well. Um, I guess moving over here, this is kind of a, kind of a fun quiz that I like to, <laughs> like to to show people. So um, a lot of things, they're not fossils. A lot of times people bring in something and they're like, oh, is this a fossil? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's what's called a pseudofossil. So pseudofossils, they're things that can look 
like fossils. Now, um, I'm going to use this one as an example. These are pretty common in this area. Um, I don't know. What do you think it looks like? Put something in the chat if you think you, th you, think you know what it is. Um, but it, it looks like maybe something that, you know, an animal could have, could have left behind. Um, it's called, colloquially, a turtle, a turtle rock because um, it looks like a turtle, but really, oh, but on drum roll, what could it be? It's called a septarium concretion. Um, it's formed underground, um, sort of similar to a geode. But it, yeah, it's just something that's made underground. It's made with like a running water under, or groundwater. That's what stuff's called, so there's that. But it looks like a turtle shell. Now here is an actual turtle fossil. Um, so you can kind of see the difference. It's like, oh, I can definitely see how this one could look like a turtle. But it's seeing the actual turtle, it's like, oh, okay. It makes sense. Yeah, this is, these are super, super common around here. Another thing, um, a lot of the things, we don't just see animals. So this looks really, really, really strange, but it's actually a coral. So. And the rocks around here, they, you'll find a lot of corals around here. It's because um, at the time where our rocks were laid down, it was actually under, underwater, it was an ocean. It was a marine ocean. Um, which is kind of fun. So, got some other things. Um, another one that's kind of cool. So there's this guy right here. Some people think it looks like a flipper or something like that. But really, these are ripple marks. So it's leftovers from, you know, waves washing in and out. Um, it looks like one thing, because our brains like to interpret, you know, try and find patterns in something to make it something cool. But it's, I mean, it's so cool. But they're ripple marks from motion. It doesn't, it, you wouldn't think that nature can create these patterns on its own, but it's, it's amazing. So, um, yeah. Thanks so much for listening to me prattle on. I'm gonna shoot it back to Kathy. Thanks so much. So dinosaurs, of course, a popular thing here at the Buffalo Museum of Science, and hopefully you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about our collection during our Rethink Extinct a virtual tour. We hope you'll be able to meet them in person when next time you visit the Buffalo Museum of Science.